What is this? Well, Dick, this site um, uh, could have been the blacksmith's house. Um, this is a large house with a cellar uh, and a huge chimney that was on the side of the house. And you can actually see how the chimney has collapsed that way. Right, um, oh, right. And uh, what's interesting about this site also is there's a side entrance into the cellar so that they can go in and out and uh, access whatever they're storing there. Uh, we've done a little bit of excavation here. Uh, two years ago, we did a test excavation in the entrance tunnel and we found the same ceramics uh, as we were finding at all the other sites, like such as the mill and the center chimney house. So again, correlating this site to the being occupied by the same people at the same time. Um, one interesting thing we did find here was a pewter spoon, which was kind of a unique artifact. Um, so yeah, this is uh, another site that uh, needs a lot of work as far as moving rock. I mean, you know, the size of the chimneys they built for these, these homes was pretty significant. Um, and a lot of them have collapsed into areas where you would normally excavate. So we're going to have to figure out a, a careful way to remove those and replace them into some kind of chimney configuration. Boy, there sure is enough to say this was a village between all these sites and similar items and the, the design of the construction and everything else. If, if I remember right, a lot of these cellars were uh, potatoes, mm. you know, for the cool, the coolness. And I read somewhere during the revolution that a lot of the... Um, burial areas were old potato farms. Oh. I mean, potato uh, basements. Oh, you know, right, right. Because they yeah. didn't have time to dig. It was, mm -hmm. they had no prisons. They had no nothing. When they died, put them in the already dug uh, potato cellars. Okay, so now this, this group of, I forget how many, come into, into Vermont. What happens then? Right, so at that time, there was a couple hundred. Or, um, or let me, let me yeah. why, why Vermont? Oh, great question. Why, why, why Vermont? Why? Why not, uh, I don't know, Rhode Island, uh, Virginia, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something. Why Vermont? Exactly. Um, well, there's a couple of reasons why the uh, regulators fled into Vermont. Uh, first of all, Vermont was not a state yet. So it was kind of its own. I mean, it was definitely a, a, a republic and it was, it was governed, but it was not a state. So it was kind of still a gray area. Um, it had been known as a haven for people to go and hide out because of its remoteness. Uh, malcontents. The, the malcontents. malcontents. Even during the Revolutionary War, yeah. a lot of deserters came to Vermont. Right. And so, um, so that was one reason. Uh, and its remoteness, the Green Mountains, is the perfect place for hiding. Uh, but Daniel Shays had some connections here, um, especially in Salem, New York, which is right on the border of Vermont, which is where the settlement um, eventually was established. His sister lived there. He had friends that were fellow officers that he served with in the Continental Army that right. lived there. Uh, also in the town of Sandgate and the town of Rupert. Uh, he also had lots of friends there as well that he knew. So it was a safe haven for him <clears throat> to go there. Um, so he fled into Vermont uh, and they tried to work their way in. They first showed up in Bennington um, and Bennington of course rejected them. They were sympathetic to their plight. Uh, but there was a lot of pressure from Governor Bowden on Governor Chittenden of Vermont um, to apprehend, you know, Shays and his men. Right. And Chittenden didn't want to do it, but then begrudgingly he did half-heartedly um, uh, claim that he would try to help out, but they really didn't. Um, but he didn't want them in Bennington. So then they moved up into Shaftesbury, and there was a meeting there where about 100 or so of the Shaysites, as they were known now, um, were hoping to move and settle in, San, uh, in Shaftesbury. Where, where, <clears throat> was that, where was that meeting? Was that the... Uh, the uh, Galusha Inn. The Galusha Inn, okay. Yes, which is still standing today. Okay. Yeah, um, and so there was a meeting there, uh, uh, and they, it was peaceful, but um, uh, the town of Shaftesbury decided not to um, have them settle. Right. So they asked them, look, we, you can go on your way. We're not going to turn you into the authorities, but you, we don't want you here. And then that's eventually how they moved into Salem, New York, which is right on that border, just um, west of Arlington, Vermont. And uh, so the, the Shaysites found uh, refuge in Salem, and uh, eventually Shays purchased land right. in Sandgate, which is now where the settlement is located on a place uh, called today Egg Mountain. <clears throat> well, if, if, it, if they came in uh, to Bennington and then went to Shaftesbury and they met at the uh, Galusha Inn, yes. was it? David Galusha or Jonas Galusha? Jonas Galusha was the, eventually the governor, but I think Jonas Galusha was the sheriff. Yes, it was Jonas Galusha yeah. who presided over that meeting, and ultimately okay. they decided for them to move on. But it's interesting because at that time, uh, Vermont was sympathetic to the plight of, of the Shazites. Um, you know, and even Ethan Allen, who was here uh, in Vermont at that time, chimed in and said, hey, look, you, you guys, I don't, and his quote was, let them cut down our maple trees, you know? 
<laughs> so <laughs> let them build it. Basically, let them build a settlement. That's here an important heat. statement. If you're yeah. from Vermont, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, like that's, it's exactly yeah. blood. That's yeah. a right, right. And uh, that so was also was, an interesting thing because at that time, of course, we were trying to there were forces that wanted to become a state. So, right. so I guess I didn't want to antagonize the other governors, but our problem was with New York at the time. <laughs> And then, uh, but at that time, I think out there in, uh, where is it, Rupert or Dorset, that we were actually minting our own coins. I mean, we were an independent country at the time. Right. The, the Harmon Mint was 18, I keep saying 18, mm -hmm. 1785 to 1788 or something like that. So that was right in that period. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating too, because even though they were finding safe haven in Vermont, the Massachusetts militia came into Vermont after them. Um, so there was a contingent of militia led by um, Major Royal Tyler, um, who was in charge of apprehending Shays and uh, the four other guys that they uh, specifically wanted. And he stayed in Bennington and sent out his troops searching for Shays. And there has been, uh, you know, in my historical um, research, we've I've found um, references to families streaming through Bennington with all of their belongings from Western Mass moving north. And uh, those were the Shazites families. And, you know, evidence of um, them bringing everything they owned with them is, is being found here um, with the archaeology that's being done. So on this site, in this whole settlement area, what's the estimate of how many people ended up here? Uh, excellent question. I think, you know, we know there's no definitive number. The only definitive number I have uh, from the Galusha meeting was about 100 or so. Um, but looking at the size of the settlement, um, you would say it would probably be 100 to 200 people lived up here at one time. It could have been the, um, the Galusha meeting was just the men, and then the women joined them to come here, right. or, or something like that. Yes. So, so there could have been, it could have been 200 in this entire settlement. Easily, and, and I know for sure that Daniel Shea's family, his wife were here and his kids, and okay, I would assume yeah, that yeah. it was the same for the other members of the, uh, you know, the, the regulator leaders. Yeah. That's great. And uh, how long have you been researching here? Uh, I've started this project really, it began in 1997 when I first found out that there might be something up here. Right. Um, and I had been slowly researching it over years, but actually it really came to the Shea Settlement Project it is as it is today, started in 2013 when I wrote a proposal to the landowners um, seeking permission to begin a scientific study of, of possibly a historically significant site here. And uh, from that point on, uh, now we're in our third year of the archaeology, and, the, and, the, and the, it's just, you know, exploded into an amazing project. So this is all new discovery in the last three years, the fort and some of these other places? Or, yeah, completely. Or, yeah. This is, uh, no work has been done here formally. Um, and uh, we've, actually, I know from local lore, people had known that the fort was here, and it's yeah. been referred to as Shays Fort, but there was really no historical or scientific, you know, research proving it. And so when, when I started my work here, it expanded out from the fort and that's when we began to find other sites and have put together this picture of the settlement um, that is, you know, painting an interesting story about this one uh, lost piece of history, really. But there's also, you, I mentioned there, there's references though, and Hemingway had references which coincide exactly match what's here. Exactly. The, it was very hard for me as a, as a researcher to find, you know, tangible proof that this was Shea's settlement from historical documentation. Uh, but there was, like you mentioned in Hemingway, she mentioned that um, there was a, uh, so it's called Shea's settlement after he escaped from Massachusetts in 1787, lived in the Sandgate area, and there was a fort, a blockhouse, a mill, a tavern, a schoolhouse, a little store, and 13 to 15 houses surrounding a village green. And you've found most of the key components of that. And all of those sites have been, for the most part, discovered, yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's amazing, it's, it's shocking. Every day uh, that we do work up here, it's just, uh, it just opens up a new page in, in lost history. There's old roads and branches. How'd you ever find this? Well, Dick, I um, had spent a lot of time in the woods um, just traversing back and forth. Uh, you know, I knew where the fort site was originally, and so I radiated out from there and GPSed anything that I th think uh, might have been significant. Um, I mean, you got to realize that a lot of these things have been cleaned off. They didn't, they didn't look like this when I first discovered them, covered over in 200 years worth of vegetation. Um, but one of the things that led me to this uh, site, um, which I just discovered uh, this spring, 
um, was mapping the stone walls of the settlement. So, the, you know, they obviously were doing agriculture up here. And so walking the stone walls, identifying them, mapping them, and then radiating out from stone walls uh, eventually um, led to a discovery of, of most of the sites. And this site is called, or you think this is Shay's uh, actual house or um, one of his houses or yeah. maybe or possibly yeah there possibly. is a, there is a good chance that this actually was the house of daniel shays uh, for a number of reasons uh, first of all if you can see compared to the other sites it's a large structure it's got a very large cellar um, and it's the only site that actually has a, an intact hearth which is amazing so this is the base of the original chimney um, of the house which is still standing um, and you can see it has collapsed back that way, but that's really exciting as far as, you know, looking at, at how the, uh, the chimneys were made. Um, so it's, a, it's the largest house. Um, also, it's proximity to Salem, which is where his sister lived. Um, this road keeps on going and drops down into Salem. This would be the uh, gateway to the rest of the settlement. Um, so it's logical that the person of most uh, importance to the settlement had the nicest house and also would have been the gatekeeper to the settlement. Um, if the militia or anyone was coming here, he could easily retreat back to the fort and all along the way um, get the rest of uh, the Shazites and, and gather them uh, to, together so that they can protect themselves. Um, there's also local lore about this one site, um, relatives of uh, people that once owned the land here um, decades ago. Uh, believe that this is, uh, they were always told that this was Shay's cabin itself, Shay's house. Um, so we have done no archaeology here yet, um, but maybe uh, there's a chance that we'll uncover something that would link it to Shay's. Now, you can't always trust oral history, but oral history is still good. I mean, you know, right. if, if it's passed on down, it may get changed a little, but if local lore is not necessarily wrong. I mean, the fact that it's not written and typed and done in Word or right. Excel <laughs> yeah. spreadsheet or, or whatever, or GPS or whatever, but it could be very well the actual site. But it could that, be. But that's, of course, the importance of archaeology to really confirm that. Right. And actually, there's one interesting thing that I've, I've learned related to, to Shays is, believe it or not, there is a sugar bowl, ceramic, English ceramic sugar bowl that was owned by Daniel Shays and his family. And it was passed down through the Shays family and it ended up in a historical society in Pennsylvania. And when I found out about it, I contacted them and they sent me pictures of it. So I have pictures of the pattern and the type of china. So if we do find any ceramics here, you know, if it's from the same set, that, you know, that would be a great correlation. So yeah. who knows if that'll happen, but it's interesting that that, that relic still exists and could be a, an important clue to, to, you know, linking Shays to this site. So the settlement was here, uh, started in 1787. How long were they here for and then what happened? Or what's yes. the story you know, continue? So uh, Shays actually purchased uh, the land here. There's land records that exist in the town of Sandgate that show that he purchased land in Sandgate uh, to establish the settlement. Um, and so they began, you know, they constructed the settlement, which was, you know, that's uh, that alone. Working. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that, al that alone, there's documentation. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Mean, with they, Daniel Shea's signature yeah, of the land yeah. sale. Yeah. Go on. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. And yeah, so they built this uh, working, thriving 18th century settlement. I mean, it had a mill. It had everything uh, that you would need to be self-sufficient. Um, and so but as well, the whole while they were here, Daniel Shays was set at clearing his name. I mean, you know, the rest of the regulators had been uh, pardoned by due to their oath of allegiance that they signed, but, you know, the four ringleaders were still wanted men for treason. And so he fought hard. So Eli Parsons, who was also part of the regulator elite, was here. And so Eli Parsons in 1788 with Daniel Shays wrote a petition to Governor Bowdoin um, and the Massachusetts legislator seeking pardon for uh, their involvement in the, re in the, uh, in the um, regulator uprising. Um, so that took a long time to actually go through, but eventually, I guess fortuitously for Shays, Governor Bowdoin was then replaced by John Hancock, of course, of fame from the, you know, one of the founding fathers of, of the United States. And he became governor of Massachusetts and immediately pardoned Shays and Parsons and all of the other um, wanted men. And so then it was over. So then that took place in 1788. Um, and Daniel Shays lived in the settlement until 1790, then he left. And uh, the others two, like Simeon Hazeltine, left around that time and he settled uh, in Beartown near Sandgate. Um, but uh, even though they left in 1790, Eli Parsons also left as well. 
the settlement continued to thrive. And the reason um, that I know that is because the archeology span is showing us that people had occupied this place up until probably around 1815. Um, you know, the things that we're finding suggest a date range that things aren't really older until about 1815. And um, one of the reasons that the settlement was ended at that time uh, is due to a series of plagues or outbreaks of disease. And um, that's ultimately what uh, ended the settlement. So the last um, occupation of this, if you will, was in what year? About 1815 is my 1815. working number so, right now. Yeah, so you're talking uh, 25, 27 years almost. Yes. Three, three decades of, yeah, you know, yeah. of somebody living here. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's and where did Daniel Shays end up? Uh, Shays left here, he moved to Arlington, Vermont for a short while, and then eventually he uh, moved out to um, central New York. And then he lived out his days there um, in obscurity, really. And then um, he eventually died an old man. And, um, and probably poor, much. too. Uh, you know, he had a farm. And then he was also, he, had a, uh, he eventually uh, got a military pension. So okay. that was one of the big fights, too. Not just Shays, but a lot of the officers and, and veterans that fought in the, in the revolution came away with nothing. Um, but he, he was eventually awarded um, his, uh, his pension for his service as a captain in the Army. So if he left in 1787 and then Vermont became a state in 1791, so yes. he left before Vermont was an actual state. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. And what's fascinating about that is the location of the settlement in Sandgate, which is right next to Arlington, Vermont. When the settlement was founded in 1787, Arlington was the capital of Vermont. So you think of the proximity. There is these, these rebels, in a sense, living right next to the seat of Vermont right, and so right. there was a there was definitely Vermont was friendly and to them and the archaeology is also showing some interesting things related to that because there is a lot of trade that was going on this even though this settlement was in the mountains and somewhat isolated um, the items that we're finding um, with our excavations are you know window glass so they had all of their their buildings had windows in them um, ceramics from England I mean they were definitely living um, an 18th century existence equal to any town in Vermont at that time. So they were actively trading with their neighbors and their neighbors knew they were here and didn't care that they were rebels. They were peaceful. Peaceful, yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Wow, what, what is this, Steve? <laughs> well, um, this site uh, I refer to as the tavern site, um, although I definitively don't know if it is a tavern, but there's a good uh, possibility it was. Um, there is references to a tavern being at the site. This is also located at the crossroads of the settlement. Um, and then the stone wall configuration, which I've mapped out, uh, almost refers to maybe this is the, the village green that was mentioned um, about the settlement. Um, so, you know, maybe this would have been a good spot for a tavern. The other reason I think it's a tavern, it has the deepest cellar hole, as you can see here. Uh, there was a, a side chimney um, and, uh, you know, the deep cellar hole for storage. So um, it's possible that it, it was a tavern. And you can see there's a lot of 20th century garbage here. Um, and this is a very difficult site to work on. We've spent the past couple of years clearing out the garbage because there was an old hunting camp that was used from about 1900 probably to the 1970s right nearby here and they threw all their garbage here for about a hundred years and um, so it's been a challenge cleaning that out old beer cans and broken bottles this is basically the only site in the settlement that has been compromised by um, other uh, you know trash from another uh, century well, what is this behind us this uh is this part of the hunting camp? Yeah, no, actually, so what this is, uh, this is the only site also that has a well. All of the other sites that make up the settlement um, are near water, um, but this actually has a well. So we started excavating a side entrance tunnel into the well so that we can get to the base of it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a work in progress. Uh, so we built this um, structure to protect it and preserve it so that as the excavations go on, um, nothing gets compromised uh, when the sites are closed down for winter. <clears throat> That's interesting. You know, a tavern, this would be very important because taverns were used for meeting places. I mean, they're almost the history of New England, Up Route 7 and other places is taverns. That's where they met, they voted, they, uh, 
argued. Yeah, they, they did exactly. everything. It's amazing, and this might have been the location where Daniel Shays and Eli Parsons penned their petition to the uh, Massachusetts government seeking their pardon. I mean, that document was written here somewhere, and this could have been a likely, uh, likely place. And then related to that too is um, there's a reference that I found uh, that Shays was seen in Arlington, Vermont, um, uh -huh. which is really close to Sandgate. And uh, he was seen at a public house and someone saw him there. They called him General Shays and they were shocked that he was there with uh, two of his uh, aides and they were armed with swords and pistols and they're having dinner and then they rode off. Um, and it, sh it shows a couple things. It's interesting that they were obviously in the area. They were still armed because of their fear of being captured and that they were friendly um, and to the people of Vermont, uh, especially in Arlington, welcomed them. You know, they're at this public meeting place, uh, a tavern there as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed our visit to uh, Shays Rebellion, the settlement here in Sandgate. Uh, if you want more information, Steve has a wonderful uh, website and I hope Hope I get this right, Shays Rebellion Settlement.org. No, I messed up. Shays Settlement. Shays. Shays Settlement.org. Shays Settlement.org. Um, it's being posted in front of you because don't listen to my interpretation. So I really enjoyed it, and uh, Steve has really done a terrific job here. But I kind of had a, a general question. What happens in the future here? I mean, this is a massive effort. You've got high school kids, you've got two teachers, yourself, archeologists and everything. What happens from here on out? Yeah, from here on out, um, you know, uh, we just want to continue to learn from the site. Uh, we want to continue the archeology span uh, to tell the story of, of these people that lived up here. And, and uh, I think it's an important missing link of American history. Um, we definitely want to preserve the sites as well to keep them, you know, and one of the things we've been trying to do with the archaeology is, and it's difficult when you're digging into the ground to try to expose artifacts, but then you also want to restore the sites as well. So we want to work at restoring the sites to the best so we can conserve them for the future um, so people can appreciate them. Um, we also want to continue the public education project. I think it's a really important part of, uh, of any scientific study is, is getting students involved, you know, kids, especially younger kids, to get them excited about science and history. Um, and, you know, maybe partner with a college or university in the future, uh, maybe a nonprofit organization. You know, we're always seeking uh, funding to, uh, to help support the right. study. Um, and, uh, you know, in the long term, it would be great to make the site accessible to the public so they can come up here and enjoy it and learn about, um, you know, an important part of Vermont history, for sure. That's, uh, it still amazes me that it's been, what, over 200 years and you were the first, what, three years ago? I forget the dates exactly that have actually been exploring this. So it's fantastic work. Uh, thank you very much for showing us around. Well, thank you for coming up. It's, it's, it's been exciting to have you here. Okay, so we will now take a quick trip to Shaftesbury, Vermont, where as part of the story, as we mentioned before, took place. We're now in the cemetery in center Shaftesbury, Vermont. If you remember the story about Shea and Shea's rebellion, Daniel Shea's left Massachusetts and came to Vermont. He came to Bennington and then he came here to Shaftesbury. In Shaftesbury, his group was confronted by Jonas Galusha, who was the sheriff at the time. Jonas Galusha at the, at the time was sheriff but he went on to be governor of Vermont. He was also a veteran. He was in the Battle of Bennington. And he was very forceful and he is well known for that, telling the Shays people that they can't stay in Shaftesbury, Vermont. Now his home is right up the road here as a governor's mansion. Well, this now is the grave of David Galusha. David Galusha was the brother of Jonas Galusha. It was David Galusha that lived down about a quarter of a mile down on Route 7A, and it was the Galusha Inn. The Galusha Inn is where Jonas Galusha um, told Shay's followers to not stay in Shaftesbury and was able to do, get them out of Shaftesbury, and he's well known for that. Now there's one other grave I want to show you before we close. This last grave I wanted to show you was of the Honorable Gideon Olin. Gideon Olin was a judge. It was Gideon Olin, as well as Jonas Galusha, that went into the Galusha Tavern 
and told the followers of Daniel Shays that we didn't want them here in, uh, in Shaftesbury, Vermont. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, Shays Rebellion had a major impact on Vermont and U.S. history. In Vermont, of course, one of the impacts was New York started to rethink its uh, resistance to having Vermont become a state because a lot of the people were coming here to Vermont. And of course, Shays Rebellion had a big impact on uh, the United States. Um, two years later, during that period, there was a constitutional convention to have a stronger government rather than this uh, art Articles of Confederation. And again, I want to, just in closing, thank Steve Butts, um, the students, the Cambridge school system, other teachers that are involved uh, that have made this show possible. So I hope you enjoyed the show, and thanks again.